it was quite <coughs> effective in running on our data set. So it ran just 10 or 15 minutes for each, uh, to train each neural net, and the memory wasn't uh, an issue because it only took one to two <coughs> gigabytes of memory. And what we did see was a good utilization of the Intel CPU multi-core architecture. So when I pressed stop and ran the algorithm, I saw that it was utilizing between 2,000 and 3,000 CPU. So that means that it was using the multi-core architecture more than 100%, which is a serial run. Uh, when I tried to run it on GPUs, I saw a speed up of, uh, of about 5 or 6. So not the 100 speed up that uh, you usually hear about, but only 5 or 6. And I think that it's because, mostly because we already saw some of the speed up uh, using the multi-cores. And the network is not so large. Yeah, it's so often, uh, it was feasible. It often run. happens in GPU with small networks. They yeah, are not, like I, I, my colleagues not run on image, on image data and they say it takes two weeks or one month. And then they are happy that they have a GPU to, to reduce it from half a year to one month. Yeah. Uh, Hyperparameter <coughs> search is a big issue in deep learning because these networks are very sensitive to the choice of the hyperparameters. For example, the number of kernels, the number of nodes, the activation function, the width of the kernels. So what we used, and it's a term that is called, uh, we, I saw in the DeepBind paper, is a grad student search, meaning that instead of doing a grid search, we mm -hmm. let the grad students yes, run yes. different parameters and pick the optimals one. So uh, my friend Ilan did this work, so that's why we got these numbers just so that they were good enough, and we didn't have enough time to do a systematic search uh, before the submission, but they worked very fine. And batch size was 128. The, <coughs> the one thing that we did look for was the number of epochs. Epochs is a term for the number of times you run over the full data set. And here to find the best in number of epochs, we, uh, we did a threefold cross-validation. <coughs> what is the criterion for assessing the goodness of the result? Okay, so that's what I'm going to move next, okay. the testing. So the first test that we did was to predict in vitro binding. So I told you that we have 244 experiments. Each experiment contains right, 240,000 probes. So we can take half for train and half for test. And since we have numbers here, x1 to x120k. Now we can predict the numbers here and compare the measured numbers to the ones that we predict. And then we have two vectors of numbers and we want to see how well we found the real numbers and we use Pearson, co we use Pearson correlation to see how well we predicted these numbers, the binding intensities. So those experiments are independent? So it's, On actually, train and test. it's a, the same experiment but the sequences are different. So you learn from one set of sequences and then you test on a different set of sequences. So the independencies in the sequences in the data. And the fact that the experiment is the same doesn't matter It probably has some effect, but these experiments are very robust. So when we have replicates experiments, we see Pearson correlation of more than 0.9, so they are very robust. So it probably has some, but little effect. The label for each of these is binary, yes or no? No, that's, or that's a regression problem, so it's a number. So you get an intensity from the experiments? Yeah. And then uh, the way we go the uh, accuracy is using Pearson correlation, which measures the linear agreement between two vectors. So here are the results. So these are our competitors and previous methods, where RCK achieved an average of 4.46 in Pearson correlation. And what we see here is a big boost in improvement of performance using our convolution neural nets and recurrent neural nets getting to an average of 0.61 and 0.63. That's really a big boost. And actually there is a new work that is still in bioarchive that already got these numbers to 0.69. So also using deep learning. But still when we published our work, this was a big improvement over the previous methods. So your work uh, recurrent is better, and in the other work that you mentioned also, uh, I think they I, uh, they use the tension models. That, uh, so I, I so I don't know if it's either more like CNNs or CNNs. Uh, yeah, 
So here I'm showing a, a, an aggregated number over 244 experiments, where each experiment is in a single proton. So now this is the pairwise comparison. So each dot is a protein, <coughs> and I'm comparing the two algorithms, for example, CNNs, the convolution neural nets, against RCK, my algorithm from a couple of years ago. <coughs> and RNNs, compared to CNNs, and each dot is one experiment. So you see this improvement in pairwise comparison. Yeah, but you try to clean the training and testing with the comparing the sequence, like the sequence similarity of entity. You mean lose redundancy? Lose redundancy. Okay, so the sets of sequences were uh, defined by the original developers of RNA Compete. They called this set set A and this set set B. And they were designed, if you recall, together, each nightmare is covered 16 times at least. So they designed these two sets so that each nightmare is covered at least eight times. So they have similar coverage of all cameras, uh, so, but they, they are, there are no identical sequences in there. They are pseudo-random. So that's why I don't think there is a lot of redundancy, but they do promise you a good coverage of all cameras in both. So now, talking about the differences from the, our competitors in the previous method that was published three years ago, DeepBind, which performed, which used an architecture that is very similar to our CNN. They first used the convolution over the set of sequences, then a rectification, which is the ReLU, the max pooling, and a neural net, which is the fully connected layer that we used. So very similar architecture. And what distinguishes their work from ours? So first, we asked uh, what is the gain that we get from recurrent neural nets as composed to uh, convolutional neural nets. And here we saw a boost from 0.61 to 0.63, average Pearson correlation over 244 experiments. In addition, we saw that when we didn't use the structure, our Pearson correlation dropped for, to 0.59. Well, using it, we got to 0.61. So is that a lot of information in the structure? Maybe not a lot if we already have the sequence and we can pick some of the structure that is encoded in the sequence. And the last set that, that we uh, tested was using a smaller set of filters. Instead of 256 kernels, using only 16 kernels, similar to the bind. And here we also saw a drop from 0.59 to 0.54. So also the parameters that we picked for the neural net, mainly the number of kernels, also helped us improve the performance that was published for the deep bind algorithm. So now moving to maybe some people would say that is the real test predicting in vivo binding. In using our models that were learned and trained on in vitro data in uh, an experiment that was done in a tube to predict what really happens in a cellular environment. So here we used eclip experiments that give us the classification between bound and unbound RNAs. So our algorithm needs to distinguish between these two sets of positive and negatives, a very common criteria to grow the accuracy is using the area under the rocker. So this is what we used here. Each experiment has uh, tens of thousands of these sequences. And we used a set of uh, 94 pairs of RNA compete, the in vitro data, and eclipse the in vivo data. And here are the results. You see that the AUC of our CNNs is on a median of maybe 0.66, which is 0.01 greater than the binds. So not a big improvement over our competitors, and the RNNs are not doing as well. And there are even some points where the AUC drops below 0.5. So something is really wrong here, right? Because we know that a random guess will give us an AUC of 0.5. So there is a lot of problems uh, in this in vivo data, lots of noise, this concordance with the in vitro data that would explain some of these 0.5 uh, numbers. But still, we get a significant improvement. So if we take these numbers, the AUC numbers, and we compare them uh, and, pre and uh, calculate the wilcoxon renkson test, we see that we have better performance, and that's statistically significant. But it's a very small improvement, uh, only an average of 0.01. So next, we ask, what is the uh, uh, weight of 
what does the what is the weight of the RNA structure features? So for this aim, we used the same test of in vitro and in vivo binding, but what we did here, we trained on real structure probabilities, so this was real. But now for the test data, we put uniform probabilities. So 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and 0 0.2. And we saw what's the difference between when we test with these uniform probabilities compared to the real probabilities. And this is what we see here. So first of all, for the in vitro data, we see that adding structure really helps. You see improvement in all of these dots. They are all above the line. And using real structure probabilities helps and improves the prediction accuracy. But here for the in vivo case, it's a mess, right? Some points are below the line, some points are above the line. So this leads us to believe that the structural information that we get on the in vivo data is just not that accurate. This is How long were those sequences? So our case, the peaks that we predict the binding for are, are usually between uh, around 50 nucleotides. And to predict the structure, what we do, we append them by 150 upstream and downstream. We do the structure prediction, and then we remove those. So we do take some context. But still, in vivo, these sequences are part of a very long sequence of thousands of nucleotides. So these algorithms don't work that well on them. In addition, they are affected by other factors in the cellular environment. And there might be complex structures that we don't even have in the in vitro data that we train on, which is only composed of short RNA sequences between 40 to 40 nucleotides. Uh, would it be more reliable not to uh, include this uh, constant on the structure, but train without structure, non include So that's what we did uh, before, and then we... To use this on, on uh, in saw, vivo experience. We saw that uh, yes, 0.51 yes. here. I remember, but... Yeah. In any case, put this into in vivo experiment, maybe. Ah, okay, yeah, right. So this is only in vitro, yeah. And then in vivo, probably, I, I, my guess is that we wouldn't see any change, right, according to this result. Well, the structure that we see in vivo is, is just in action. You, you would not include structure, then you can have advantage with this method. Ah, you say even better performance? Yes. Ah, okay, because this is wrong. Because okay. structure is fo false. Yeah, yeah, could be. The in vivo or in vitro? The, the in vitro. In vitro, yeah, it's, indeed. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Strongly biased. So, yeah, that's another. This, this in vitro data was designed specifically <coughs> to have a structural context that is not P, but is another context. So, that's another thing. We might not find uh, other contexts uh, that are found in the in vitro data. Is, is there yeah. any way to form t training set from in vivo data? So, we could do cross-validation on the in vivo data, right? Take the data, cut it into half, do some training, and then test in the other half. And GraphProt are doing that. And they get, they get very good results, AUC of 1.99. But do you believe that these are really good predictors? Or do they overfit the experimental data? You, you can do two experiments independently. Right, experiments. replicate experiments. Yes. And when I ran GraphProt on, exp uh, uh, on uh, uh, replicate experiments, I think in some cases it was all close to 0.5. So there is, a, I think, a lot of data. If I if I train on the in vivo data, what am I studying? Is it intrinsic binding preferences? No, it's the occupancy of the proteins to the RNA under many factors and conditions. Yes, yes. And what I want to do is to piece out the different factors. Right. So if something changes in one factor, I can predict what is going to happen. But if I have it all in one picture, then I cannot take the pieces out. So that's why I'm, I'm attracted to work on the in vitro data, which gives me cleaner information. But it has its disadvantages. Well, these are different areas to use this multi-factor uh, analysis, but it's much more sophisticated. Okay. Yeah. Maybe someone applies. If you have rich data in, in, ah. in, in view, they may attempt. Okay. Yeah, it could, could be that someone has applied these ideas of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, another issue is how do we interpret these neural nets? How much time do we have? 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Oh, okay, so I'm fine. So another problem with these uh, deep neural nets is how do we visualize them, interpret them, right? These are black boxes. Biologists don't like to get black boxes. They want to understand biology. They want to learn what's happening. But it's still an unsolved problem. 
and not just in bioinformatics, but generally for everyone who is using these deep neural nets. And the way we use this is this using these heuristics where we identify the high confidence binding sites using uh, the kernels that were, and we picked up sequences that were above some threshold. Then what we did, we aligned them and we counted the number of A, C, G, and U in every position, which is a very common way to get probability frequency matrices. So now we can have a distribution over the nucleotides in each position. And eventually you can plot them using sequence logos. The height of each letter is inverse to the entropy in that position. So meaning if we have only a single letter here, for example T, we have the highest T reaching two bits of information. But if we have a uniform, we would see very uh, small height, very shallow letters. And the distribution over them is given by the nucleotides and their heights. So this is one nice way to see the strictness and the preference of the protein to bind in each of the positions. So here are Still, it's an open problem, so we didn't solve it optimally at all, and, and uh, uh, I'm happy to hear about suggestions. So here are some of the comparisons that we did. We took our data and, and, and created this visualization where you can see the protein likes to bind U, U, G, U, A, and we can also get the structural context, and we compare it to a graph plot, another algorithm that was run on clip data that found the same sequence preferences, U, U, G, U, U, similar to what we find here. So a different algorithm run on a different data set over the same protein found similar preferences. So it's always very nice to see different data sets and even different algorithms coming up with the same conclusions. And we also see some similarity in the uh, uh, preference to bind the stem, which is the P context, the paired context. We have other examples where we see the preference to bind G, C, U, G, G, which was also found on an older data set by a different algorithm again, uh, with the preference to bind the stem, which is the P, and helping loop, which is equivalent to the L here. So again, different algorithms on different data sets coming up with the same conclusions regarding the binding preferences. So that is a very strong uh, and convincing uh, evidence that we picked up at the right or at least the two algorithms were wrong, that's also a possibility. And there is also the last example, where uh, the HUR protein, which likes to bind the U stretch, and we also pick it in both algorithms on different data sets. So this is, goes to the visualization, and this leads me to the conclusion of the talk. So I've shown you that deep learning is very effective in predicting protein RNA binding. And actually, I am very excited about using deep learning uh, nowadays to solve many other problems in bioinformatics, any kinds of high throughput data, meaning thousands or millions of measurements of RNA or DNA sequences or, or amino acid sequences that you can give me or my collaborators can give me. I can generate a model very efficiently, write a code very fast in Keras and Python, and, and it's a lot of fun that I have and my students. So I enjoy many other types of works that are very similar to that, that apply the deep learning on biological data. RNN, in our case, performs better in vitro, but CNN was the overall winner. But there is still a lot of problems with the in vivo data. So maybe we achieved good performance in vitro, but I think I didn't convince you that we solved the in vivo problem. Uh, so it's still something that we as a community needs to solve, and maybe we need to take other data into account for example, the amounts of RNA that is available, the structure, but not predicted, but measured in an experiment, or other types that can help us. May one uh, create computing environment in vitro? Yeah, kind of. so there are, there are experiments and see how where you put two proteins, or may, and you or see many, yes. how they bind together, or the competition. And see whether a single experiment may predict this uh, more complicated yeah. experiment. Okay. It's intermediate but imagine step. that if you have N proteins, you need... And over two experiments. <laughs> uh, no, you, you can oh, just okay. this group, not, not, not yeah. all combination, but random. Yeah, so there are different ways you can do it, yeah, but uh, people are doing it. Yeah, I know about pairs, uh, but I haven't, try, I haven't heard of more than pairs. It, it would be intermediate validation even of your technique without getting to all right. mess. Right. In, in if that can explain some of the disconcordance between in vitro and in yes. vitro. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So 
yeah, we are looking for these uh, types of data and measurements the more, uh, that can give us more information. I have two uh, questions, basically. One relates to the temporal behavior of that system. I mean, there is a, some time constant to get the binding. It's not yeah. immediate, right? So, maybe you can say a few words about yeah, that. So this is uh, uh, let me, can I answer? So these experiments don't measure what is called the dissociation constant, which is a physical term that stands for the time that the protein would sit on, on but they do it in a, in a uh, I mean, the way that the RNA complete is that you get the binding, you wash it, then you pull down the bound RNAs and, and then hybridize to a microarray. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's not KD, that's not me the absolute measurements, but it's some proxy to them. So... So, the K, you can measure KD in high throughput, but maybe to 1,000 sequences or a few thousand, but not the same throughput that we get <coughs> here, and currently only to protein DNA binding. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The other question relates to your thermal structure. If I understood right from the slide, it's basically a 2D sort of description of the structure. But proteins are 3D, you know. Well, first and, of all, yeah. And, and 3 I mean... The 3D structure determines the function and the affinity and everything. So how do you deal with it? Yeah. So currently in this work, for me the protein was just a label, just a name. I didn't even look at the protein yeah, but structure. But in vivo, this is not the case in vivo. Definitely. And in the future, one of the things I want to solve, one of the problems, is to come up with a recommendation systems for proteins. So imagine given a new protein, without any experiment done on it, try to predict which DNA or RNA it would bind. Similar to Netflix, comes a new user which is registered, you want to predict to which movie we'd like to watch, but just given his uh, gender, geography, uh, 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 age, and so on. So, and then I, I think definitely the structure would be important and we need to take it into account, but currently in this work, the protein was just a label and I, and I ignored it. <coughs> uh, maybe more than the structure, maybe the electrical. Yeah, yeah, like properties of the amino acids and so on. No, I agree. Yeah, so we are looking into those problems. Is the recurrent network uh, implementation assume a directionality? It's bidirectional, but it has to assume uh, some direction. For so. the model itself. But is it biologically, does it have a direction, the sequence? Good question. So on DNA, you have a direct, so there is a direction uh, from, it's called 5 prime to 3 prime. Yeah, so you can have a, a different direction uh, that the protein looks at, uh, right? In double strand DNA, you would have one strand which is five prime to three prime, and the other strand would be in the right re reverse direction. But on the RNA, we only have a single strand, and I think so. We can have both direction. I think uh, that are important. Both of the contexts, the sides could affect the binding in one. Context. Yeah, and especially if it's the structure. Both directions. Yeah. So, so what they so exactly the. the uh, architecture that we used is, is in, uh, I think, what I showed here, it was uh, bi-directional. Okay, so there's two... Yeah, definitely. <coughs> could, you, could you please elaborate about kernel for CNN? Yeah, so a kernel uh, for us would be a matrix of fold over K, where we pick K to be either 5 or 11 and then in each position you have in each column you have four weights now we apply it this is the sequence kernel we apply it on the sequence one hot encoding and we have one bit which represents u in this position then we might have g here so we have o uh, 0 0 1 0 and then we multiply the weight here W4, 1. So we multiply each column by each column, and we add it to the next column. So Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. So here we will get W4 plus Z3, and so on. You start from uniform? So we, uh, you can start from uniform, and then the gradient descent updates these parameters to minimize the loss. But yeah, usually you start uh, from either uniform, zero, uh, normally distributed, uh, those kind of uh, weights that you initialize eventually, uh, initially. And then if you have size k and here the length is L and it's 1D convolution, the number of outputs is L minus k plus 1. 
because you apply the convolution on each one. And then the additive weight, the, ed the weights are added, so it's an additive contribution of each column. Sequence and structure. Yeah, and then we had also the structure. Yeah, exactly. So we had the structure, which is 5 on L. And then it had a different curve. Yeah. It multiplies these numbers over 5 probabilities, over distribution. In the beginning, you threw the analogy with images, which is very good. You should carry it all the way. And then come. And it will bring you to the conclusion that uh, you can also solve the in vivo. But in the in vivo, again, it's a problem of dimensionality. And the number of uh, the, the architecture that you need, the number of nodes, the number of weights, and the number of uh, training. It points that you need in the training set. Google uh, solved problems with enormous numbers. If you look, into what they really did, like recognizing the cat. They had 60,000 computers for that. You don't have in your machine <laughs> 60,000 zeros. So it, it's just a question of having enough of the training, enough weights, enough nodes, and so on. You will, you will find that you can do it. But even in your data, if you look carefully, I think that you learned the, the data from several proteins, right? Right. If you look, one by one, you saw them by the colors. You see that for some proteins, you are there. Yeah, some like, proteins are easier like than others. Like the blue protein, I don't know whatever yeah. it is, the sequence, but... Uh, yeah, let's uh, see. Yeah, Here. look at the blue. No, it's about... It's, 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 much, it's much better than the others. So you should look for the reasons. Why is it that uh, in the in vivo, some conditions are imposed for this protein. Yeah. Naturally imposed, not that you impose. But I think that in terms, if you, if you carry it on the on a machinery that only one has it, only Google, you, you will be there. Well, there are uh, like companies in the industry are probably competing in mm -hmm. that, deep yeah. genomics, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, maybe. But I think there is a lim some limitations to the data. There's yes. some signal to noise ratio that yes. you can. I mean, yes. mm -hmm. some of course, parts. of course, when you go to the database that uh, Google has in terms of images, they have they are they have um, a database of three trillion about three trillion images. So it's and I think it's much it's cleaner, it's, more, it writes, more, it's manually yeah. curated. Someone yeah. told them that there is a cat or something like yes. that. So it's well, yes. yeah. so the in vitro environment is, is much cleaner. But, yeah. Yeah. This is maybe the analog. But that's not a problem that someone told them. You can also move to autonomous. Uh, sort of deep uh, neural network. It's not any longer deep neural network, it's something else. But there is methodology for autonomous training, unsupervised. Okay, but it's, yeah, it's not the case here. Yeah. But, and can discuss it offline because then maybe yeah. get what you mean. Okay. Anybody have any more questions? So I want to thank uh, Dr. Lawrenson again for yeah. coming to us. Thank you.